James down the last shot the bartender was willing to give him. His friends were already being shooed at the door as he stumbled to the booth to get his jacket. He nearly flung himself on the floor, trying to throw his jacket around his shoulders, but he threw his hands up in celebration when he managed to get it all under control. His friends were acting like idiots, like they do on most weekends. Two were roughhousing while one puked in the truck. Charlie, who always drank the least, was sitting on the curb, waiting for an Uber update. Service was always spotty in the mountains. He always warned, get out early enough to make sure that somebody be around to pick them up, and he audibly huffed, seeing no cars anywhere near them. So what do we do? I, I don't know. We're in backwards bumblefuck, and I'm too tan to be walking around in the dark in, the, in this country. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to wait until a car comes available. His eyes panned over his two friends, who were now all hunched over in the truck bed throwing up. Besides, they need to get it out of their system because I'm not paying for another cleaning fee. They sat quietly, sobering up as the music stopped playing inside, and only the sounds of the intermittent splats in the truck bed. Caw! The sound cut through the night and startled James. He looked up and saw a large raven peering down from the power lines across the street. It was so inky black he could barely make it out against the night sky. You drunk too, bird? You're supposed to be in bed. He stood up and he grabbed a rock and he chucked it at the bird, and it casually sidestepped the wire and flapped its wings as if it were mocking him. He squinted and shook its head. Something didn't seem right, and he could have sworn he saw something, but he just assumed the drinks were really strong that night. Charles looked up as James stumbled to his feet and dusted off his butt. Where do you think you're going? It's going to be an hour before Cheryl gets home from the hospital, able to do anything if an Uber doesn't show up. An hour? We could almost be back to town in an hour if we walked. Yeah, an hour walking along an unlit winding road down a mountain. We're going to get hit by three cars before we make it. And that's if you don't manage to fall over a guardrail and hit every rock on the way down to the bottom. He jumped up, clearly more sober than he was. Just wait till thing one, two, and three throw up everything in their stomachs, and we'll wait till Cheryl gets here. Uh, you realize that's not even their truck, right? I'm not hanging around for the bouncer to beat their asses for flooding his truck bed. He did his best impression of a sober person and started down the side of the road. I'll be fine. A half hour later, James was not fine. He was stumbling around in the dark, tripping over branches along the, the road, and he ripped a hole in his jeans the third time he went down. This was clearly a mistake, but even on a sober day, James was a stubborn sort. Every time he went down, he got back up, more emboldened to make it down the mountainside. And he made sure to always be on the opposite side of the guardrail. Even drunk, he knew not to walk along the guardrail. Falling over meant hitting a dozen rocks down a steep embankment, and that was only if he was lucky enough to not latch onto a branch on the way down. He might survive the fall. Why take the chance? The worst thing that could happen on the other side is just uh, trip over whatever trash might have been in the ditch, which at this point seems like three trees worth of broken branches. And confirmation came five minutes later when he stumbled onto yet another branch and cursed the lack of street lights in the night sky. He rolled onto his back, regretting his decision, staring upwards, and was startled to see black eyes staring back at him from the top of the pole. He had to blink to adjust his eyes to believe what he was seeing. He had to blink to adjust his eyes to believe what he was seeing. Was that the same raven? It cawed and shook its wings, and this time he saw what he thought he saw the last time, but much more clearly. Sparks seemed to shake out of his wings as it never broke its gaze from him. And the idea this bird was following him didn't make any sense, and he was regretting the last shot of the night. It's not there. It's in your head. He squeezed his eyes shut, ignoring the wind whistling by his ears, and he looked up again, and nothing. And he laughed to himself. Maybe a couple weeks without drinking might do him good. This time, still the same, he started walking with a little bit more purpose. He wanted off the mountain and thought the idea of waiting with Cheryl might have been a good idea. A hard gust of wind and rustling whooshed by his ear, and he wheeled around trying to force his eyes to focus in the dark, but he was off balance and the gravel along the shoulder was loose. He tumbled down hard, but this time he tried to catch his fall and his hand tore open on a jagged bottle. He winced and tried to suck in as much air as he could to stifle his scream, and he wrapped his hand quickly in his flannel, and he pressed it and tried to keep from, from bleeding. Caw! This time it was balanced on the guardrail across the street, and it was a lot bigger. Even in his quickly sobering mind, he knew it wasn't a mistake. He could have been saying things at the bar, he could have even been saying things a few minutes ago, but this was unmistakable. 
Its black form straightened and its wings spread wide, showering the ground with sparks as it breathed in deep. Caw! He wasn't thinking anymore. He didn't know why, but he was terrified. He gripped his hand inside his flannel and broke into a dead run. He had to get away. He needed to make sure that he was off the mountain. He needed to be away from this thing. Then he started running down the middle of the street to avoid any debris. He knew at any moment a car could come around the winding road, and then he wouldn't have time to react to the lights. But he didn't care. He had one thought, and it was away. He was breathing heavily, but it didn't matter. He was lightheaded and felt the need to throw up, but it didn't matter. He had to get off the mountain. He got to a bend in the road and took a moment to be able to look back. Its wings were longer, its talons elongated and muscular. Embers trailed behind it effortlessly as it floated. His eyes went wide at the sight and the sensation of his feet tangling up. His momentum sent him tumbling over the side of the road through the gap between the railings. He tumbled end over end into the hollow into a bend in the road. It was a long drop, and he didn't land softly. He felt his ankle snap and his knee twisted under the weight of his body as it crashed down. He heard a hissing on the wind, and despite the intense pain, terror was the only thing on his mind. He forced himself to look up, no matter how scared he was what he might see. The monster's wings softened and elongated and billowed in the gusts of wind that seemed to radiate from it. The almost human eyes of an old woman gazed at him as her feet softly rested onto the ground, but despite her lithe appearance, her steps crushed with the weight of something hulking and massive. She inched closer, bending towards him. Even in the darkness, he could see her tongue licking across her lips. You seem to have taken quite a tumble, young man. Her voice was rasped and cut through the din. He flailed his hands at her, just growled and yelled, and she caught one of the injured arms mid-swing. It felt like a vice grip no old lady could possess, and she lapped the blood as it leaked out of his hand. You're strong. Maybe you would live another sixty years. Her grasp tightened, crushing his wrist, and a scream echoed in the quiet night. She threw him against the, the hill, propping him up on the incline, and before he could slide down and slink down, her hand slammed into his chest, and his eyes darted wildly as he tried to scream, but the blow knocked any air that he could muster. Pain radiated down his arms as his chest felt like it was being burned and skewered at the same time, and she threw back her head in ecstasy. When her eyes next met, she was chewing. Blood ran down the sides of her mouth. She let go and relaxed her, her figure as she kept chewing and moaning in pleasure. And James looked down, expecting to feel a gaping hole in his chest because of the pain, but nothing was there. No cuts, no bruises, yet he couldn't catch his breath. She fished out a piece of sinew from her mouth and slurped on it and flicked it at him, instinctively cupping in his hands as he caught it. He didn't recognize what it was, but he knew the straw-like piece of meat was the reason why he couldn't catch his breath. He was wheezing, trying to force air into his lungs, but to no avail. He tried to scream, but a slender finger pressed against his lips. Shh. Now, now, boy. There's no need to waste what little time you have left on pain. She fished the piece of meat out of his grip. He tried to hold onto it instinctively, but even his grip was beginning to weaken. Thank you, young man, she said with a blood-soaked sneer. This will keep me going for a very long time. She jumped into the air with the grace of a bird, embers scattering into the night sky, and her figure faded away into the darkness, shrinking away. The last thing he saw before the last moments of his life slipped away was a raven flitting away on the breeze, and the headlights of Cheryl's Chevy slowly making its way up the mountainside. He definitely should have waited with Charlie.